So overall, like long story short, we got this molecule that gets generated when you exercise. If you supplement more, there's a good chance that there's some really good exercise-based effects that are going to get amplified. We, wrote, we blogged about it in 2015. Things went quiet, but not on the research front. A lot more things happened. And finally, we have a trusted and tested ingredient supplier who's providing a stable form of it. And one last thing is I, I emailed them last night, and I asked them for a, uh, a lab test, and they timestamped a lab test like an hour and a half after I emailed them asking for it. Welcome to Price Plow. Welcome back to the Price Plow Podcast. This is your host, Mike Roberto. And once again, we are so honored to have the incredible Sean Wells with us. Sean, it's been a little while since we had you on. There's been a couple changes, so we got to update that absolutely massive resume of yours. So um, we, we've done two videos in the past, and that's where we gave you a very good introduction. We talked a lot about uh, nootropics. We talked about using the keto diet to help assist with... Uh, let's just say with serious diseases. And now we have a very more a specific thing that we want to talk about today. But Sean, let's get, let's get a little bit of a catch up on what you've been doing lately. So I see now that you are uh, listed as the chief science officer for NNB Nutrition, which is a company that I've begun to dig into. And uh, I'm very happy to start doing a little bit of work alongside you there. And so I want to talk a little bit about what you've been doing and how we're going to uh, shake things up in the, uh, in the sports nutrition and supplement industries. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on, and I'm I'm super passionate about novel ingredients. Uh, you know, I've patented and worked on ingredients in the past, like t cream and dynamine and ketones and berberine and some of the things that we've discussed. Those are all things that I've I've researched and and led patents on, and now I'm working to. Uh, advance NNB Nutrition. They've been a partner of mine for years in terms of sourcing and my relationship with them just continued to grow as uh, I saw that they tested out consistently. Their customer service was amazing as they, you know, purchased factories, as they have like over a hundred scientists that they're working with. They're adding trademark experts and patent experts and now part of the team is Dr. Ralph uh, Yeager and Dr. Martin Perpura that are legends in sports nutrition research. And we just all got together and decided, what if we put all of our collective energies and brains together and made really incredible ingredients and tried to change things up in the system? And that's what we're doing. We're coming up with extremely novel ingredients that have a ton of patent potential, great science behind them, and they're actually going to test out, not only on an HPLC type level, but they're going to test out on an efficacy level as well. And you're not going to have to worry about, you know, them coming from China and being, um, you know, filled with heavy metals or, you know, having uh, ephedrine or DMAA metabolites or whatever. This is, this is so clean, so legit, and that's why I'm working with NNB, because again, they just, they consistently test it out on every front for me. Like, I'd come up with an ingredient, and like two weeks later, it'd be in my hand. You know, like something I just dreamed up. And I'd send it out for testing, and it's 99.9% .9 pure, and it's like, okay, like, let's do this, you know? And, um, and NNB has the ability to scale these ingredients up and and make these dreams become a reality. And my biggest passion is just these ingredients get in people's hands. Like I want people to have better workouts, better lives. Like instead of just having like a bunch of caffeine and arginine and flavor uh, and a pre-workout, let's like let's really do something that's efficacious. Let's really move the needle. Like science needs to move ahead, and I want that to happen. Right. And so, if you listen to a lot of other uh, podcasts, as Sean, a lot of times the phrase "the world's greatest formula" gets thrown around, and sometimes you know I kind of uh, you know uh, <laughs> I laugh at that because there's a lot of really good formulators out there, but. Then I put you to the test a little bit. When I was uh, running a constant glucose monitor and testing my ketones, I used one of the supplements that you formulated with this berberine that you talked about in the last video. And then we promised we were going to talk a little bit about, more about berberine in the next video. I think we're going to do that really soon. But anyway, if we make a link back to that in the, in the YouTube description, I was floored by how well the berberine that you sourced worked. And you, 
I, it, to me, it like solidified everything yeah. that Sean Wells had been talking about, and that um, you know other berberines. I've seen a few that just didn't like make a huge dent to like blood sugar. I wasn't able to really uh, let's just say absorb as many carbohydrates as I would I would have hoped to, you know to have. And then your berberine yeah. that you had uh, formulated, and there was a couple other ingredients in there. The, the product just absolutely was stunning. And that's where I was a believer. And so it sounds like NMB Nutrition is where you were getting some of those raw materials from. Is that correct? Or is this like where you're working with this, uh, this form of berberine here? Yeah, totally correct. So berberine, um, first off, like I've told everyone, is my number one most important ingredient to take. I love it. Uh, for advanced glycation end products for metabolic dysfunction, insufficient cellular energy states for glycation, inflammation, oxidation. Berberine is as powerful, if not more powerful than metformin. That's been shown. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's just an amazing glucose disposal agent. It works on AMPK, but it has like a number of other mechanisms. And I can tell you as someone who's done keto for a long time, it in and of itself would take me from like, let's say if I was at like a 0.5, to like a one, 1.1, 1. 1, something like that in and of itself, just the bird. And it's, it's amazing. Like I, here's, I think I told you this example, but this is mind blowing when I was testing it. I did a, a carbohydrate challenge and I did a fun one. So it was, uh, I believe it was five double stuff Oreos and two frosted pop tarts. Nice. So, yeah, this is fun. If I'm going to have fun, it's better than 75 grams of dextrose, right? So I did uh, one week I did this uh, with placebo. Um, and then the next week I did it with the berberine. And I was at 65 to 70 for my baseline blood glucose. And when I had the carbohydrate challenge, I was checking my blood, blood sugar, blood glucose every 30 minutes for two hours. And with the carbohydrate uh, and, and placebo, I, I got up to 199 at two hours, and I don't even know if I was coming back down. When I had the berberine, are you ready for this? Mm -hmm. I had the berberine, I never got above 100, and at one hour I was already coming back down. Mm -hmm. That's insanity, Mike. Yeah. That's insane. But it gets even better. Like that was like where all this started, and like I formulated IC5 for BioTrust, and that's the product we're talking yes. about. And yes, like out of uh, 40 different berberines, we tested literally 40 different sources. One tested out. One. So I will say, like, you don't have to buy BioTrust IC5. I don't benefit financially from it. It's a good product, uh, and I formulated it. But you could buy like Thorn. I know that tests out. There's very few products on the market, whether they know it or not, that actually tests out. And a lot of them, even if they test out by HPLC, don't test out by HPTLC for species. They're spiked. So they're spiked with other herbs that, that make them look like they have enough polyphenols and, and things like that. And that's an issue. So... Um, berberine is a powerful, powerful compound, but it gets better because we decided to patent the metabolites and the metabolites are dihydroberberine and tetrahydroberberine. Um, and dihydroberberine is what you need to convert berberine into in your gut for actual uptake. And so the data shows that it's about six times more bioavailable. Some people have issues with actually uh, there's bio individuality on the on the uptake of berberine. Some people don't get the same effects like maybe I would. So it just depends. For most people, it's very effective, uh, but you have to take higher doses. About 500 milligrams three times a day is the study doses. And with dihydroberberine, you can drop that dramatically. It's it's one sixth the dose. So around like 100 milligrams. So that, that really opens things up for how you use it. And from there, there's actually some research that says transdermally, it's about 30 times more bioavailable. So it's very interesting 
uh, to use this compound dihydroberberine. Um, so that's kind of the future of things. And NNB does have that ingredient. It's called uh, Glucovantage, but that's something else we'll, we can discuss in the future. I but do, right. I still want to promise to the, the viewers and listeners that we're going to do a deep dive on berberine because uh, I, I don't even think you haven't even touched on some of like the, the muscle insulin sensitivity, why it's great for, for working out. And I, I love charging up carbs. I notice a big difference. Like I'm very carb sensitive and when I use it <clears throat> versus when I don't, it, it is a very big difference. Um, so you, you contacted me and you said, hey, Mike, <clears throat> I know you guys are all about efficacy. You're getting more into the ingredient science more than ever and everything. And, uh, and Ben was at Supply Side West. He's like, you got to check out this NMB nutrition company. They are like, they are the guys that are doing things right. So I went over to their website and the first thing I saw was an ingredient uh, called mitoburn. And I was like, I'm always into burn and fat loss and weight loss stuff. So I'm like, okay, this sounds like a good fat burning ingredient. And then I realized it was beba. And I, I was so astonished and so happy to see this because in 2015 we wrote an article about beba and there was like one product on the market at the time and yep. uh, right now price doesn't even have it listed anymore and then it just disappeared from like anyone's thoughts pretty much at least like within the sports nutrition realm but this is like kind of and i'm gonna let you explain it's kind of like the exercise molecule this is what's generated when you exercise and it's and and since we published that article and we were really excited because it, it seemed like you know uh it seemed that supplementing it at least in the mouse mouse based studies could have a ton of those exercise kind of ish effects ever since we published that article it went quiet but there's been like a ton more studies so uh i checked it out i looked at what nmb had in their white paper and i found even more research that's happened so between 2015 and 2019 there's been like five extra really, really impressive studies done on this molecule. And I'm like, oh, I, these guys are willing to put this on the market, a, t a tested and trusted version of this. I want in. I, I want to get I, – I've already been updating our article, look, talking about the new research and everything. And I actually right here just got in a bag of the stuff. So I am going to be testing it. So subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube. I will be uh, putting it into the test because it might have pro-ketogenic effects as well. Uh, so in this video, I kind of want to I want to talk about beba and talk about like maybe who would be interested in using such an ingredient uh, that is really we're still a bit on the on the bleeding edge of things it seems in terms of a pioneered ingredient that mostly has a lot of really good animal research and a lot of really good theoretical mechanisms, uh, but who might benefit from it and who might not and and like why anyone like yourself or a different formulator would want to use this in a formulation and what kind of formulas would, would you want to use about it use with it so uh let's just let's just jam on beba and then we're definitely going to have to get to, to the uh berberine stuff again next month because i want to keep keep it coming with a lot of these topics there's so many cool things here to discuss so what are your thoughts on beba were, were you involved in the in the uh the creation of this ingredient or is this something that nmb has already been working on and do you have any like reasons for why like it kind of went quiet over the last four years or Let's get the whole background, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, definitely involved in the creation. Uh, we've been working on it for about five years, and yeah, there was a company that did come out with it, but we've been, uh, we were really, a lot of these ingredients we work on, not only can we make it, can we make it stable? Can we make it bioavailable? Can we make it scale up? so that we can make it at, at economically feasible quantities. A lot of these companies that say they have these ingredients don't, or it's at 1%, or you know, it's something like that. I mean, this is chemically not too far off from beta alanine. Right. So you might be able to throw in a bunch of beta alanine and like one milligram of beta and you know, say it's, you know, but it's, so it's a lot of work like, you know, when we were first working on uh, theocrine, for example, like it was like $20,000 a kilo, you know, like a lot of this stuff, it can take years to really work through the process so that it can be economically feasible. And we're making it so that it's not impure. Like there aren't the like the try and reduce the steps chemically in the synthesis. So there's less impurities. So there's less economic uh, impact. Uh, so there's a lot going on that, that takes years of research. We work on validating the, the testing standards. Um, and then we work on things like grass and toxicology and <clears throat> animal studies and human studies. And to be honest with Beba, 
where, like you said, it's at the bleeding edge, you know, and, and I think a lot of your followers can appreciate this, but this isn't really ready for, let's say now foods or the big time, but we're going to get there. But for people that are looking for the bleeding edge, this is where it's at. And, and you know, if you want to be the guinea pig like you and me, I mean, you know, this is where it is. Like, this is exciting research, exciting potential. Um, I wish we had more human data and we're working on it. That's what I can say. Like, but that's a very expensive, time consuming process. You know, sometimes we'll set up a study and then we'll, um, you know, there has to be the IRB approval. Sometimes there'll be dropouts. Sometimes it's like right at the cusp of like, uh, you know, the, the the kids are out for summer or the winter break. And it, it can be very frustrating. Um, but we're getting there with all the research and we're working with really high level CROs and um, and academic institutions now to get the answers. But yeah, the, the data in terms of mechanistically, in terms of um, in vitro and animal data, mind blowing. And of course, like anecdotal data that, that we have back, like uh, people love this stuff. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm ready to, to get into all the mechanisms and, and talk about it. But I wanna throw that out there first that you know, what we're going to discuss is is more mechanistic in vitro and animal data that's that's extremely impressive. But if you understand how it's working, um, all the logic is there and the human data is forthcoming. So just want to throw those caveats out there. Awesome. Well, if my human data counts, I'm going to be doing a little bit of YouTube human data. So that's the best yeah. I can do. My, you know, the N equals one. And when enough of those N equals ones add up, uh, I, it does at least stand for something. But of course, we want to see a randomized controlled trial and all that. But in general, this is a molecule. I call it the exercise molecule. But this is a molecule that is generated in the body after or during exercise. And the question is, so when, when um, researchers early on, maybe the early 2000s, maybe even before that, saw all right, a lot of these people are exercising, have a ton of this stuff being generated. And then eventually the supplement guys come in and, and ask, hey, maybe uh, can we supplement that to get some of those exercise-based benefits? And possibly that's kind of the, the gen genesis of BABA, but what, what really happens back uh, when you're exercising that, that creates this? And can supplementing it add a little bit of uh, add certain benefits, even if you're not exercising, or is it best to use when exercising? So a lot of questions. So. What, what happens here? How does this stuff get made? Yeah, exactly. So like you were talking about, it's a metabolite. There, there's the there's two isomers. There's a D and an L. And of course, you could have DL, which is mixed isomer. But the D is made from thymine and is not metabolically active. The L-beba, the, the L-isomer, is the biologically active one. And it's made from the branch chain amino acid valine which, you know, like BCAAs are a big part of lean body mass um, composition. So the catabolism of your lean body mass uh, may lead from exercise, may lead to conversion into BABA, L-BABA, and it's a signal as an exercise mimetic. So two things to your point, it could either augment exercise like meaning your low intensity steady state exercise could be translated more to a high intensity interval training to your body. Or, or if you are sedentary, and I'm not just, uh, you know, I throw this out with a big caveat because the FDA would freak out at the idea of saying you don't need to exercise or eat right. So I don't want to say that you can't say that per the FDA, but I think it has interesting potential, let's say, in people that cannot exercise, that maybe like are in a nursing home, that are uh, invalid, that have a uh, high potential for pressure ulcers, um, you know, and things like that, that like I worked with all that uh, in, in hospitals and nursing homes. And the idea of being able to use something that is a mimetic, meaning it simulates exercise and signals that your body is exercising whether it is or is not is fascinating 
Um, so, and then all the things that the windfall of, of mechanisms that, that fall into place after that signal goes out is, is truly fascinating. But it starts with PGC1 alpha um, when you're exercising, and that translates into four different metabolites. You have beta, GABA, uh, cytosine, and 20-deoxycytidine. And from that, like the beta is the one that triggers uh, beta oxidation of fatty acids and insulin sensitivity. And then we also see a number of other things from it that are really exciting. So is it technically like an amino acid, but it's, it's not an amino acid like used as a building block for protein. It's more like a signal. It's a, it's a message that, hey, when this stuff's generated, a, a chain reaction of events will occur based upon its presence. Is that kind of a... It's a it's an amino acid derivative of kind of like carnitine or, you know, something like that. So it's, it's very chemically. And like I said, chemically, it's very similar to beta alanine. It, it doesn't have the same effects, but I do, there's no data to show this, but I do wonder if, let's say you're metabolizing one of the key, the most prevalent amino acids in muscle, valine, because of extreme exercise. And then you're turning that into a signal called beta. And then I wonder if once the signal goes out, that gets converted. I, I don't have the data to say this, but it would be interesting. That gets converted into beta alanine and some other compounds that may have beneficial effects on endurance with exercise and protecting the body as a buffer with exercise. So that's a fascinating, yeah, there's, there's so much research that needs to be done but this compound has so much potential. It's exciting. Well, yeah, one, one thing I noticed is that there was a study, I think it was from 2004, and that we were actually setting in an article. It shows that it is actually pro-ketogenic and it increased in the rats, or in the mice at least, it increased the amount of beta-hydroxybutyrate that was in the plasma. And this was before the whole like keto rush got pretty crazy, but beta-hydroxybutyrate or BHB is the primary ketone body. And... Um, that you know is generated when you're on a low carbo ultra low carbohydrate diet, for instance, or when you're doing crazy amounts of exercise, yada yada yada. And so I, I didn't really understand that at that at that time. But then looking back now, I, I see that this molecule seems I, I, I don't want to call it like it doesn't seem to I don't know if, if you ingest it, it burns more fat, but it seems that those effects kind of start to happen at least like you get more or not you but mice at least get more bhb generated like you mentioned beta oxidation seems to ramp up which is fat burning so how do you like how do you describe that effect and right i think from from two mechanisms that that make sense to me um is that you're getting greater beta oxidation in the liver uh for burning fat right and you're also so more fatty acids available for uh, fuel and exercise, but also, which makes sense, right, as a signal, but also that you're um, having more uh, translocation, uh, more storage of glucose, or more utilization of glycogen in these scenarios. Um, so, but it does seem like there's more GDA, like glucose disposal, like glycogen storage happening, uh, similar to like berberine. So, Yes, if you're getting more fatty acids available, more fatty acid, more fat maybe being converted to ketones, more glycogen, uh, more glucose being stored as glycogen, these things are happening. That makes sense that ketones would then potentially go up um, and be available as a, as a substrate, um, as a fuel for exercise. Gotcha. So yeah, one of the studies uh, talking about insulin sensitivity that I, I thought was really interesting was that they put the mice on a high fat diet and it wasn't an ultra high fat diet, but they did it to the point where the mice were so like fat adapted that they started to, started to be, actually become uh, insulin resistant in that if you threw some glucose at them, they wouldn't be able to handle it as well. They were not very metabolically flexible uh, mice at that point. 
And I actually did that to myself. I have the blood, you know, the old YouTube videos that show that on my CGM is that when I was in an ultra low carb mode, you throw me 75 grams of sweet tarts and I'm going to have, I'm going to, I went up to 200 and I hung up there for about a couple hours or so. I, I think I was just, yeah, I was just under 200, just like you. And it hung there for a little while. When I was on 50 grams of carbs per day, I was able to handle the carbohydrate load way easier. So anyway, I was, I was glucose um, or I was insulin resistant to that degree where, you know, I was so like not used to using glucose. They did this to the mice and then they gave a group of mice on that high fat diet, uh, the BABA. And for whatever reason, those mice were able to handle a load of glucose much better. They had lower, uh, they had lower fasting glucose scores and they actually ate a dash more, even though it wasn't significantly, uh, statistically significant, but they ate a dash more and they didn't gain as much weight as the other control high fat dieting mice. So I thought that was a, a really interesting study because it's like I've been there before and I almost want to repeat these studies on myself, but with Beba as well. So I, don't, I, it was, I was wondering like, is this good for keto dieters then or is it Good for it, but it also seems like it would be helpful for high carb dieters too. So it, it seems just like a universally beneficial molecule. Like, what do, what do you make of all that? To totally, it's just like berberine. Um, and, and and just as an aside, I totally agree with you on metabolic flexibility. I have I've been keto for twenty years, and I'm not anti uh, anti carb by any means. I think carbohydrates are a tool for those that are physically active. Nice. If you're completely sedentary, don't have carbs. If you're physically active, have carbs, just time them correctly. I don't believe in co-administration of carb and fat unless you're just having a fun meal. But I think that's when, you, that's when you can run into some metabolic issues that really aren't simulated out in whole food in nature. Like that's these high bliss point foods, these engineered foods, these high fat, high glycemic carb foods that really aren't good for you. But people that are eating whole food throughout the world that have 80% carbohydrate in their diet, they're not fat. Right. Because they don't have an issue with it because they're active and they're eating whole foods that are high fiber, low glycemic, and they're fine. Um, so it's I never demonize carbs. It's it's not about that. It's I like some of the states that I get into in ketosis for my autoimmunity, for inflammation, for things like that. Um, so I love, I love ketosis at times, but I like the idea of metabolic flexibility and being able to, to be dual fuel. Um, and I certainly think like, uh, the leaner you are, the more carbohydrate tolerance you have potentially, and, uh, especially the more muscle mass you have. So, um, but getting back to uh, what you were talking about, whether it's best for a ketogenic diet or, or a high carb uh, athlete or whoever, I think it's both. You know, when I use berberine, I use it year round, every day, no matter what. And I put everyone on it. I think the whole world needs to be on this because it's hard to avoid high glycemic foods. It's hard to avoid high glycemic, high fat foods. It's hard to avoid at times being sedentary or metabolic stress that that or meta or mitochondrial dysfunction and all these things where we might not be optimal in terms of our insulin sensitivity, um, all those things. So I like it every day, all the time for berberine. And I think you'll see the same effects with BABA is that it's kind of like saying, when is it good to eat healthy? All the time. And basically berberine makes foods lower glycemic makes insulin more like you more sensitive to insulin right and it's just like that with baby like when is it good to exercise oh, it's always good to exercise right so like and and you're right it does help with both fuels and it just puts you in an optimal state for exercise it's augmenting exercise it's a signal so when is it good to get exercise all the time so you know beba feels like one of those things like berberine that's almost like a must-have unless i will say this if you're probably already an elite athlete an elite athlete with elite physique and you're already like you know hammering away on on exercise all day every day you probably won't see like 
great effects. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're a mid-level athlete, an aging athlete, someone who's not eating optimally, someone who's gone through injury, someone who's um, maybe leans more towards sedentary even, then you're going to see pretty tremendous effects potentially. So um, that would be what I'd throw out there. I think it's going to be beneficial for both ketogenic uh, and carbohydrate dieters. Okay. Now, now getting back to the exercise and the naturally produced beta in the system, you kind of made a differentiation before about the low intensity steady state list versus high intensity interval training hit. And you made it sound like if I was doing lists, I, I could possibly augment it with with Beba or Mitoburn is the, the NMB you know uh, trade name for for Beba. But so am I creating more Beba in my in my body? Like right now, if I just went and trained without any in my uh, you know any supplemental in me, if I did high intensity interval training, am I going to generate a lot more than if I just do a boring list workout? Yes, okay. for sure. And there, so, there's going to be some generated regardless, but. The high intensity interval training will will create more in a shorter period of time. Okay, gotcha. And yeah, those those benefits, everything starts to connect. Like you know, those benefits seem to be the ones that are the most, at least the best bang for the buck and everything. And really, again, on my constant glucose monitor, I have a video where I was, I was reviewing a carb supplement. I went and did ten minutes of burpees, not straight, but it was like you know thirty on, thirty off, and. It tanked my blood sugar. I wasn't doing anything else. I didn't have enough carbohydrate in that supplement, actually. And so doing those kinds of exercises, I can definitely move the needle a lot on the glucose levels. I really wish you know, anyone could like monitor their, glu their glucose without having to spend $1,000 or getting diabetes and a prescription because it's so it was so useful. But you could tell it that something's getting generated behind the scenes, and there's probably more than just BABA, but it's like one of these cofactors that just seems to come along for the ride. And I've... Yeah, I, I, right there on the blood monitor, I notice there's a big difference between doing the boring workout and the 15 minutes of insanity right there. So uh, I, I have to, I have to think that baby was one of the things that was happening that was getting, you know, generated in a uh, more copious amounts. Uh, a lot of the research talks about with this molecule now, uh, I'm, I guess both endogenously and exogenously taken talks about the browning of white fat cells. So is that something you've kind of dug into at all or some of the studies? That was some of the, the earlier studies where people are starting to get really interested in it and then it's kind of gone from there. But I think there's a really good 2014 study by Roberts maybe that uh, talks about this mechanism. Can you, can you sp talk about that a little bit and how BABA is involved in it? Yeah, so with brown adipose tissue, first off to explain that, um, you have about five ounces of brown adipose tissue on your body, uh, mostly around your collarbone, your clavicle. Um, so it's like it's core to your body like if you were to lose your extremities let's say like you know think about evolution if your arms or legs were to get cut off or bit off or torn off like how would you maintain body heat right thermogenesis to maintain homeostasis like this brown adipose tissue comes into play for years we never thought it was that important except for babies that that's how they maintain thermogenesis before they have the ability to shiver at about six months in, that that's how they can maintain their body heat. But we found that maybe it's like the the secret factor, if you will, of like the people that just stay lean. You know, there's there's probably a lot of factors, but this is one of them. That like, oh, that guy can eat anything and he just seems to stay lean. I hate that guy for that. He probably has more brown adipose tissue. And sometimes it's not just about how much you have, it's a factor but how active it is. Those are two factors, right? So, and, and if you look at people, there's a wide bio-individuality on that, how much they have and how active it is. One of the things that we can do to increase brown adipose tissue, both in the number and activity, is cold exposure. So cold thermogenesis, so doing like cold plunges, uh, cryogenesis, things like that are really helpful. And we're so thermoregulated now, we rarely do that, right? We're always at room temperature. We're not going through these large deltas of temperature variants, like this, even on the high end with like, you know, saunas and, and heat exposure. So that's one thing that we can do. Now, it's, it's now considered like the holy grail of fat loss. 
It, the reason it's brown is because it's so mitochondrial dense, right? So that means it's highly metabolically active. These, this small amount of fat, like only 1% of your fat is brown adipose tissue. The rest is white adipose tissue. And for the most part, people want very little white adipose tissue, but I can promise you, you want brown adipose tissue. This is one fat you want because it's so metabolically active and it just, it's thermogenic to the extreme and it's just burning through calories. And what you'll see is that the people that have more brown adipose tissue have greater energy expenditure. And we've even seen with things like um, grains of paradise and studies like that, that uh, you see 150 extra calories burned from just adding 40 milligrams of this one extract. It's crazy, right? Because it increases brown adipose tissue activity. But this brown adipose tissue, now they're trying to figure out like, how do we take all the white adipose tissue that no one wants and how do we at least beige it? Uh, browning might not be the exact right word, but like beige it so that it gets closer. It won't, like it's at least one tenth as active as brown adipose tissue. And when you have 99% of your fat being white adipose tissue, that could still really move the needle. So that's what they're looking at is compounds that do that. And fascinatingly, beba is one of those things that seems to have an impact on ad adipocytes and converting them more over towards being metabolically active. Awesome. And so this, this works both within your body, like when you're doing the high intensity interval training, which is shown to be very metabolically active, and as well as taking beba supplementally, at least for mice. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And, and that is the caveat right now is, is, you know, we have people that are taking it that seeing the benefits in terms of changes in body composition and performance, but we need the, the randomized clinical trials. And of course we have all the animal data and we have the mechanistic data and all the genes that are being turned on and pathways that are being turned on and vitro and all these things. But we don't have the human data in a randomized clinical trial to say, yes, in fact, that's happening. But that's I, I definitely keep on mentioning the mice and everything. I, I, I'm not afraid to not afraid to say that. This is where we are. You have to be honest with uh, a new ingredient. And when I was saying bleeding edge, that might not be the best term. I meant to say cutting edge. But I, don't know, I don't think anyone's going to be bleeding. But anyway, um, the, uh, well, the last thing. The thing, though, like, you know, is like when when you get to the point where you have all the data, then everyone's using it. <laughs> like, I mean, I want to be there and we're pushing the envelope and I'm the type of scientist that really wants all that data. And we're putting in hundreds of thousands of dollars into the data right now in multiple studies. Awesome. But I can say that if you want to be out on the cutting edge with a competitive advantage, sometimes you got to be... <laughs> you know, go with like a, at a little earlier point where the data is at. So. Right. Definitely. Yeah. And, and so, uh, looking at the, the new research, there was also even a study and it's tough to like correlate what's happening, but we know that people, especially the elderly who, um, who exercise more have better bone density, less breakage and, and, and like less, you know, hip breaking. And that's such a huge thing as you get older, of course. And what they're noticing with at least the younger mice is that when you give them more beba and don't let them exercise, their bones stay like more dense as well. And so I'm like, I'm wondering like all these awesome effects we're seeing from exercise, if some of them at least are coming from beba. I'm not sure if you saw that study, but I, I was yeah. impressed with that one as well. And, and uh, not sure how that applies, to, if that would apply to old people who aren't able to exercise because it didn't work as well for the older mice. But again it's like hey here's this extra this this effect that works with exercisers and here's this effect that this supplement is creating without doing it and i of course again don't want to make claims on not exercising because we always recommend it whenever possible uh but it's just like fascinating to to see that maybe this is the signal that we've been looking for all along exactly and that's the difference here is this isn't like a substrate this isn't just a fuel source or something in a pathway. It's a signal. It's a signal for exercise. And so, yeah, there is a study, like you said, that it shows it affects bone mineral density and specifically by affecting osteoclasts and osteoblasts and blasts. Like if you know cells, like the blasts are kind of like 
after you like go to a stem cell, then you get to the point where cells are differentiated and and now it's like a bone cell and, and a blast is creating new cells. And so, yeah, it's literally triggering new creation of, of bone cells. And, you know, with that, it's interesting, bone mineral density is going to be key to supporting lean body mass and lean body mass is key to supporting bone mineral density, right? I mean, we know those things like that. There's a really, there's a strong relationship between those tissues that the greater like your bone mineral density, the greater your bone health is, the greater it can support that muscle around it. But the same holds true that like the more muscle mass that you have, the more you see greater bone density because the bones need to stay dense to support the muscle. And it's just, it's just this vice versa uh, relationship. And there's a lot of crosstalk. People tend to think like these tissues are just, you know, like a slab of muscle, like like the thing you put on your hamburger or a bone is just something that can break and is just essentially inert. But these are highly dynamic tissues that are constantly not only changing and remodeling and remolding, but they're also talking to each other. There's, there's this cellular crosstalk between tissues that are happening. And so they're very much alive and very communicative and there's a lot of signals that are happening. And one of these key signals that seems to be like a windfall of a lot of positive things is BABA. Mm -hmm. Are there any known side effects that we've seen? I didn't really see much in any studies. I know that there was a pretty high um, LD50 dose in the mice, like very high. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think so. Like it's augmenting exercise. It's a signal for exercise and it happens naturally from an amino acid that's in your muscle. So I, at least at the doses we're talking about, no, but you know, I mean, someone's going to be a, a ding dong out there and probably use 10 times too much and be a ding dong people. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and that's where I was going to go next though, is, is uh, let's talk about dosage. Now, a lot of those studies, obviously the mice, we're not going to use those, those doses. I have here a whole hundred gram bag and how would you, um, how would you begin using this? I, on the on the MitoBurn website, it sounds like it's the the serving sizes. You take it maximum of twice per day, and like what was it, two hundred fifty to five hundred milligrams? Or am I doubling yep. that? Like, no, so, that's yeah, right. How would you? And and I really, you could probably go. It's just it gets pricey. You could probably experiment with up to a thousand milligrams, especially I think if you're. Uh, someone of, of large lean body mass, a bodybuilder, maybe you could experiment with that much. But I don't, I just, I don't recommend going like, you know, into crazy doses and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, because we just don't know. We right, just yeah, don't I'm know. With, yeah, I'm going to stick with, with everything. This. Everything seems safe. Like the LD50 is good. The toxicology is good. And, and in terms of mechanistically, it's very safe because it's coming from valine, coming from the muscle. And, and like I said, it's very close to beta alanine and all these things that make sense and they're safe that we're taking and it's a natural signal and that's cool. But I don't know specifically if you take 5X the dose that like these side effects start to happen. Right. I don't know. That. So I don't, I wouldn't. Cutting edge. So exactly. Um, okay, so I have, a, I have a couple questions. So if I, I have a really good, you know, and, and I, I of course have a real nice fancy scale and everything. We'll measure it out really well um, with the milligrams and everything. If I take it, what should I expect? Like I'm going to try to take it so low or, you know, with my standard like 200 milligrams of caffeine just because I'm addicted. <laughs> but um, w if I take it so low, what should I expect? Am I going to get hot? Like is this going to be like one of those like, heat-inducing ingredients or – and, and I just sit here. Do you think I should, I'll notice anything? I think it's it's going to be one bio individual. Two, it's going to depend on the exercise you're doing and the timing and dose of your administration. It's going to augment that. So I think, like I said, like it's going to make your high intensity interval training more high intensity. It's going to make like your um, eight reps feel like twelve reps. You know that kind of thing. Like so. It's it's a little complex into to how it feels. It depends on your type of training, but it's just an augmenter. Like uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that like like we love the hack 
of high intensity interval training that you can get all this work done in 10 minutes versus, you know, two hours. And this is one of those hacks that's it's just going to like, I think, take you up another several notches so that you lose more fat mass that you maintain or gain more lean body mass that you maintain more uh, bone mineral density that you uh, elevate ketones, feel more clarity, feel like more of that runner's high, like after your workout, that kind of thing. Like you're just going to feel like you had like, you know, like when you have a great exercise session and you killed it, like and you love that, like kind of high when you're kind of strutting out of the gym or whatever. I mean, this is going to put you closer to that. Gotcha. And, okay. then, and so you're, you're talking I a lot like, about exercise augmentation and that would yeah. be, I'm not exercising twice a day though. So on the other half of the day, would it be suggested that I, I'm going to have a couple questions here, but yeah, would it be suggested to take it again the other half of the day or would you only take it in a pre-workout setting? I would, if you have the money, I would be taking it twice a day. Uh, but if you don't have much money, then I would definitely do it at least once a day. We need to do more work like with the, with the pre-workout, sorry. Um, we need to do more work on like, is the, we know it's good twice a day. And we know it's good pre-workout, but we don't know if like, let's say if you're going to have a thousand milligrams a day, is it best all spent on pre-workout or is it best 500 milligrams twice a day and it's just overkill and wasted if you just do the thousand milligrams once? I don't know that. Like gotcha. we, we need to get more data there. So I think some people that, that are listening to this will be um, formulators for other brands. So let's have you put on your, your formulator hat and if you were going to put this into one supplement let's say we got sean and mike super brand here what one supplement and we can only put it in one supplement which supplement are we going to put it into is it the fat burner the stim free fat burner the pre-workout like um where where do you think it's got the most use if you're formulating uh, definitely definitely the pre-workout what's that yeah I think definitely the pre-workout, it's a no-brainer to me. Okay. And a lot of those keto products, for sure, like it can, it can augment that and maybe you can lower the amount of like mineral, mineral salt load and some of those things. Um, it, could, it could stack well with berberine and vice versa. Berberine would stack well with this. Um, and I love that idea. Um, I would think doing some kind of dose, like if you already have like a flexible dosing protocol with your pre-workout, like where you can take one to two scoops, you know, like one for, you know, if you're whatever, not going as extreme or you're a female or whatever, two, if you're a hard training male. 20, and 40 serving tubs that we're seeing all the time. Yeah. 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 So if you're doing that, then I would think like 250 milligrams for the the single serve and then, you know, 500 milligrams for like the kind of more extreme dosing uh, would be ideal. Um, and I think that should be highly effective to, again, augment your exercise experience. And so it stack well with. Uh, any of the things that um, affect uh, beta oxidation, like you said, like the methylxanthines, like caffeine, tecrine, dynamine, those kinds of things, it would stack well with uh, berberine um, as a glucose disposal agent. It would stack well with ketones uh, because you're already elicit eliciting like a response um, ketogenically. Um, and then beyond that, um, I think maybe more of the BCAAs could be interesting. Um, it would be interesting to see if there's some kind of synergy with valine itself um, and beta alanine itself. So I don't know. Um, there's a lot of, yeah, a lot of research to be done or a lot of tinkering to be done. And that's cool because a lot of brands can try to do different things with it. But all right, in general and, though, it sounds like free oh, workout. Oh, last one, last one that be interesting is to your point with fat loss and, and some of these stacks is definitely the, the grains of paradise oh yeah um could be interesting as well um with that beijing brown adipose tissue effect and then some of the cellular energy stuff like um you know looking at uh these nad compounds That's like nn and r um uh, PQQ, CoQ10, those could be interesting as well. 
Um, cinnamon is another one for insulin sensitivity. Um, you know, carnitine, arguably, whether that has some positive impact, but those are some things that I would look at, yeah. Awesome. All right, cool. I don't know if I have any other questions. I'm like more confident and more excited to bust into this bag that I've, uh, I've been waiting on. So here's what we're gonna do. This is uh, this video, I, I think a shortened version will be going on our IGTV, uh, but in general, this video will be on YouTube. Today is November 12th, 2019. Should have said that way earlier. And um, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna put this on YouTube and then I'm gonna start tinkering with it. We're gonna go live on, on IGTV. So follow Sean at Zone Halo and follow us at Price Plow on Instagram. I think we should go live together and we're gonna talk about some of my experiences uh, after I've kicked it off for a good week or so. I'm gonna to try to do some ketone tests and everything. And we'll, then if we add any more information, we'll also rebroadcast that back to YouTube as well. But um, I think we gotta go live and kind of have some fun with this. I'd like to tinker with it first. So thanks again for like getting this uh, sent over, our, over here. And, and uh, we're gonna, we have the updated article. We're going to be doing a little bit more. And if there's any formulators out there listening, hit me up, hit Sean up, and we could uh, talk about getting some of this into your hands. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we have some good experiences here, but stay tuned and subscribe to the channel because I'm gonna be posting a little bit more about what happens here. Uh, so overall, like long story short, we got this molecule that gets generated when you exercise. If you supplement more, there's a good chance that there's some really good exercise-based effects that are gonna get amplified. We, we blogged about it in 2015, things went quiet, but not on the research front, a lot more things happened. And finally, we have a trusted and tested ingredient supplier who's providing a stable form of it. And one last thing is I, I emailed them last night and I asked them for a, uh, a lab test and they time stamped a lab test like an hour and a half after I emailed them asking for it. So like, I, exactly. I, I, yeah, NMB Nutrition, like they really, you guys seem to be on top of your game. I, I, so far, everything's been like really impressive. And just the second I saw you had, that you had Beba, I was like, sign me up, get me some of that stuff. And here we go. So really excited. Sean, anything else to add uh, other than what we're going to be doing? And then next month we got to talk about, we, I want to do the, the, the Berberine deep dive, but do you have anything else to add? Like, did we miss anything or? No, we, you're not missing anything. Working on uh, actually right here, uh, getting a, uh, a bunch of, of uh, infographic kind of stuff uh, ready for you and, and all of your followers on, uh, on BABA. That should be pretty exciting. But yeah, we already have white papers and articles and different things that you and I are working on. And I think it's, this, is, this is one of the most, like you said, cutting edge ingredients that's really a whole new frontier of, uh, of research and exercise. It's quite exciting. Excellent. Good. Well, Sean, as always, is a great time to talk to you. We always learn so much. Everyone loves the videos. And uh, I, I think this one, yeah, we, a lot of people may be uh, consumers kind of interested in this ingredient. And uh, as we post this right now, there's no end product that has it. But if the, you're a formulator listening to this, like, let's get in touch. We got we to put this in some stuff, like whether it's a GDA or a fat burner or a pre-workout or anything, stem-free fat burner. Like I I, I really want, want it on this. So I'm going to be one of the first to, to publicly test it. So subscribe to the channel. And we will definitely have Sean back on, on IGTV to talk about the results. And then we got to get into that berberine because that stuff that, like I said, phenomenal. So thanks again for your time, Sean. No problem. Thanks, Mike. See ya. See ya.